how can you keep your fire for God? How can you follow Jesus Christ in a busy world? Hey, shalom and welcome back to this week's program. You are watching Kingdom Insight, a program that brings you the Word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, with Kingdom Insight, our goal and our passion is to be able to hear the voice of God and to bring you the insights of the power of the Word of God that brings deliverance, that brings life, that brings hope, and that brings impact empowerment to live life with God. With me on the, in the studio here is my friend, uh, uh, Brother Milan. We've been looking at getting out of an, op an, uh, an oppressed system, getting out of a system, an oppressive system. You know, there are so many things that will oppress you. Uh, uh, the devil, the enemy comes to oppress people. Thoughts of suicides, thoughts of, uh, you know, uh, uh, just a death, and thoughts of feeling as if you are unworthy. That is an oppressive system, and the enemy wants to bring that oppression over the people. But with God, with the Holy Spirit, and with the power of the Word of God, we have what it takes to break out of an oppressive system and reach out to the life that God has given us. We've been hearing the testimony of uh, of our brother Milan here, and he is with me in the studio. Once again, welcome to this program. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a privilege for me to uh, be here today. And uh, <clears throat> you know, I just, I'm just going to speak the truth. You know, and uh, you know, some people might think that it's not uh, politically correct, or they would say I would never say that in public. Well, I'll tell you something. Um, from what I lived and what I learned, what I experienced. I'm only going to speak the truth about this. Amen. It's good because, you know, it brings freedom to others. It brings uh, revelation. I know it's a tough topic coming out of, uh, you know, communism or communist party, coming out, you know, from the background that you come from. And uh, what amazes me the first time I met you and uh, we discussed and we talked was uh, how the Holy Spirit transformed your life. Now we are back on this sec second segment. We talked about how you were living in uh, Czechoslovakia, how you escaped, going to the border. Now you are outside uh, the Czech Republic, your country. Now you are in Austria. Tell us now life as you go into a refugee camp. How was it? Well, you know, that was uh, also... Um you know, to, like I said, how the Lord, as I see it today, I see hand of God using my brother at that time to really pull me up, you know, when I was down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so we decided, all right, uh, we, tomorrow morning, we said, at that time, we said, okay, tomorrow morning, uh, we're going to go to the police station in Vienna. Now, you have to understand, from the regime where I was raised, you know, police, they were not your friends, you see. They had the full control and charge and uh, the, you know, all the rights they had in that country. So they could do anything with you as they desired to, you see. And going to police station in different country, I still had that fear in me, you understand. Uh, I, I was scared to go there, but I knew I had to go there and say, you know what, I'm not going back to check. I'm a refugee, I want asylum, you know, I want to stay here, you know, I'm, I'm not going back. Right, so I had to I had to go there. So we decided. All right, next day we're going. So we got up, pack up our little tent, pack up the motorcycle, and drove to near uh, police station. And you know, I, I was very scared. I tell you, honest to God, I was scared. I didn't believe in God, but I was scared. You see, and um, so while well, we went there with our broken German language, we tried to. Um, because I did not speak German, tried to tell them what was going on. And one of the officers uh, finally got the idea of what's going on. And he said, he basically explained to us that they don't deal with that here. But for the refugees, you know, there's a certain address we need to go in a day or two. And we need to go there. That's where they gathered the refugees in the capital city of Austria. It's called Vienna. And that's where they gather the, the refugees, and that's where they, they deal with all this, right? So, you went to, the, to that so that's location? When we, that's when we went to that uh, second location. And uh, from the second location, they basically transported us to uh, 
my brother was on the bus getting transported. I was on the motorcycle behind him, and we drove to the about maybe, I'm guessing, 30 kilometers south of Vienna. It was an old army base, old brick barracks, you know, and that's where the refugee camp was. It's in the little town of Treiskirchen. And that refugee camp, believe it or not, it's still there today. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And what happens in this refugee camp? Well, you know, uh, in the refugee camp, first you were in isolation on the interviews, you know, mm -hmm. and finding out uh, about you, like, you know, trying to figure out, are you a spy or are you a legit uh, refugee and so on, right? So you have to kind of have some kind of story for them, you know, to yeah. tell them um, so they don't send you back. Yeah. You see, you still, even if you're in the refugee camp, it doesn't mean they cannot put you on the, uh, on, 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 the, on the train or something and send you to send the border. You back to the border. Yeah, they could do that too. Even so now tell us a little bit the difficulties in this refugee camp as well as to the missionary uh, uh, in camp. I want you to tie oh, those two. Oh, that's an interesting oh. thing. Yes. Yeah, okay, so um, one rule they had, they said you cannot work. They said, you don't have social insurance, we call in Canada, you know, you don't have a permit to work because you know the landed immigrant, you're just staying in the camp, so you cannot work. And you have to understand that I was raised to work. Yeah. Not only at work, but when we came home from work, we worked again. That's how my father was, that's how we were raised. You need to accomplish anything in life, you work hard. You work, you work hard. You work hard, all right. And so, you see, um, they let us out of the isolation. Mm -hmm. They put us into a room where there was, I would guess, about maybe eight or 10 people, mm -hmm. army bunk beds, you know, uh, one on the bottom, one on top, or old metal beds from some kind of uh, um, uh, army, you know, from army it must have been. And they were painted green, I still remember. And they put, they tried to put same nations in the same rooms, but sometimes it was mixed. And there was people at that time from Russia, from Bulgaria, from Poland, from Yugoslavia, uh, from Czech, from uh, East Germany. There was people escaping slowly from all these countries, and they were gathering them in these refugee camps in different places in Europe, you know? Now, so you are in the refugee camp. Tell us how you decided to begin to pursue to move to Canada now? Yeah, that will happen unexpectedly, actually, because first we tried to get to Germany, and that didn't work out. And so I said, all right, then when we were at the refugee camp, the guys were telling us, you become friends all of a sudden with people there, you know, and um, they in the same shoes like you are, yeah. they are out of their old country, and they're hoping that somebody will take them elsewhere. And they were telling us that America, Canada and Australia was taking at that time refugees. And we just felt, me and my brother, somehow Canada. We didn't know nothing about Canada. And we decided that it's going to be Canada. We just didn't feel right about America or mm. Australia. So we decided uh, Canada, you know. Mm. And you arrived in Canada now, in Fort McMurray. Uh, you are in Canada. Let's speed up here. You are in Canada. Life now, the oppression that was in the, in the past, it's over here. We are in Canada. What happens in Canada? Well, first thing, uh, uh, first thing with, with Canada, what happened, it's actually the interview in Vienna. That's how it started. Uh, we had to go for interview. Yes. Uh, we had to borrow a suit and we had to go see Canadian ambassador. We applied, you know, to come to Canada and they would not allow me and my brother to go in at the same time. Mm -hmm. One only, yeah. one at a time. Mm -hmm. So I went first and the ambassador asked me a question. Mm -hmm. He said, why do you want to come to Canada? Mm -hmm. And he had a translator, and I told him, I said, I want to come to Canada because of the freedom. Yeah. Because of the freedom, because freedom of you can say things, uh -huh. you can do things, you can live like a human being, you know, uh, I, I need that freedom. That's why I want to live there. And he asked me again through the translator, why do you want to come to Canada? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, didn't I tell him? So I tell him the same message again, and it comes through the translated third time, firm. Why do you want to come to Canada? And I'm thinking, this guy doesn't understand yeah. uh, English, I, I guess. Freedom. Yeah, I want the freedom, right? And then he asked me something. He said, uh, are you working in Austria here? And me and my brother worked hard. Mm -hmm. We were digging out uh, basements. We were working with wheelbarrows, jog hammers, whatever. And, and, um, and I didn't know what to say because I, know, I knew it was illegal mm -hmm. to work. And the Canadian ambassador is asking me, do you work? And I'm working nearly every day I work yeah. there, Saturdays, Sundays, I worked all the time. And, and I said to him, uh, yes, 
I'm working. Somehow I spoke the truth. I used to lie a lot. I used yeah. to lie a lot under yeah. communism. Because under communist, that was you the had system. to lie. You had to lie. You were raised to lie. Yeah. You know, the communist, so even that's your the mom system. said, don't lie. You had to lie under that system yeah. to survive, right? Wow. And you had to lie, and stealing was very common. I wouldn't yeah. steal from you, yeah. but from the government. Everybody yes. was. That's how it was. Because that, that's how the system was. You, you got to understand here, w when you begin to understand what influences our lives, it's certain systems that has been in place. Look, even lying was uh, a part of the system to get some favors. You know, until we break those systems in our lives, as we're going to hear, you know, we break those oppressive systems, we can never move forward in life. Now, I, I don't want to go further here with you, the viewers. I know you want me to unleash that punch there of what I want you to see with God about breaking out of an oppressive system. Let me get back to my brother Milan here. Now, you are in Canada. You've, you've, talk, you've talked to them. They allow you, uh, sorry, you, you are in Vienna, they allow you. Well, the ambassador, to get right? The ambassador Canada. asked me that question, which yeah. was critical. Yes. Uh, if I work. And somehow I said yes. Yes. And you know what he said? Mm -hmm. Show me your hands. Mm -hmm. And I had bloody blisters. Yeah. You see, if I would have said no, I don't, yeah. and I would have shown him the hands, yeah. he would have seen that I lied. Yes. And he looked at my hands, and he says, All right, um, looks like. You might be able to come to Canada. Mm -hmm. But he says, about your brother, mm -hmm. it's not going to work. Yeah. So it's up to you. Yeah. What do you want to do? And I don't know how it happened. I look him in his eyes and I said, you know, I thank you so much for the opportunity and for the offer that it looks like I might be able to come to Canada. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand, this is my brother and he's my family. And we both of us left that system, and we both of us here in the refugee camp, and I will tell you something, I want to come to Canada, but without my brother, I'm not going, because he's my family. Mm -hmm. That's what I told him. Yeah. Well, he did exactly, my brother told me later, he did exactly the same thing with him. Yes. You see, in that interview, he tested yeah. us. Yeah. And so, the envelope came about three weeks later, whatnot, in the refugee camp, and people were ripping envelopes, you know, with excitements from embassy, you know, yeah. from the Canadian government, and, and some people were come, go, going to Toronto, mm -hmm. Vancouver, Calgary, you know, we could find it on the map. Yeah. Me and my brother rips, rips the envelope, we look at it, Fort McMurray, Alberta. Yes. Well, 1983, we couldn't find a place on the map. Yeah. We couldn't find a place, and everybody was saying, where are you going, where are you going, you know, where are you guys going? It was almost like I was a little depressed. I, I go, I don't know, I don't know. It's not, that, well, look it up. Well, we couldn't find the place, you see. We didn't know where we were going, yeah. you see. So, but in all yeah. that, I would say that God had a plan. Amen. God had a plan. And so we came to, like you asked me, yeah. brother, you asked me, so we came to Canada. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. Uh, and it was uh, the last day of November in 1983. We landed in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And we had to go, first thing off of the plane, we had to go into the immigration office. Mm -hmm. And there's a lady sitting behind a computer, you know, the computer monitors where it used to be big, like a television, you yeah. remember, them big ones? And she was Polish, she could speak little Czech, and she's typing things on the computer, and she says, um, okay, um, so you're entering Canada, so we need your information to enter here, you know, mm -hmm. so she's punching it in, and she goes, what's your first name? Mm -hmm. And I said, my name is Milan. Mm -hmm. And she says, what's your last name? And I said, last name, it's Posednik. And she goes, well, what's your middle name? And I'm looking at her. She goes, what's your middle name? And I don't understand what she's asking me. She, she wants middle name. She says, what's your middle name? I said, well, I, I have first name, Milan, last name, Posednik. I don't have no middle name. She says, you, don't, you guys don't have middle name? Where you come from? I said, no, I am Milan Posednik. She goes, well, you cannot enter Canada if you don't have middle name, because the computer needs middle name. Yeah. And I'm sitting there, I go, what are we going to do? I don't have a middle name. I cannot come. I'm in Canada. I, I cannot come to Canada. Yeah. She goes, you know what we're going to do? We're going to type in letter R for middle name. So since that day, I'm Milan R. Posednik. Wow. So that's how I came to Canada. 
Praise God. Now, Praise God. Here, here, you know, he's in Canada. You open up a shop, a motorcycle shop. Remember in our first segment, we talked about his passion for the motorcycle and why one of the main reasons why he was even leaving his country. Now he is in Canada. You're going to set up a, uh, a shop for the motorcycle. You join the motorcycle club. Tell us briefly life in there, and we're going to move out to the Christian Motorcycle Association. So what happened there that uh, when I came to Fort McMurray, first thing I did, I opened the telephone book and I looked if there was a motorcycle so shop. Mm -hmm. And I seen it was called Vitwin Cycle, and that gave me sort of peace. I had peace all of a sudden. I know it was very cold there in December, lots of snow, but you know, I had peace. There was Harley Davidson, and that was my God at that yeah. time, you see. And so That's uh, who you worshipped. That's where it was. Yes, yes. And so that gave me a peace. And, uh, and as God brought somebody into our life there in Fort McMurray who really helped us. Mm -hmm. It was an older gentleman. Uh, it was in his early 50s. His name was Joe Soboda and his family. And they took us in like their own family. They, we were, you know, we, we didn't speak English. We had to learn English, new language, new culture, new everything. We didn't have a clue. But this man with his family stood behind us and cheered us on and helped us to make these, you know, these uh, steps on the beginning. And that was very important, very critical, like having a family in different country. Yes. Very, very, very helpful. You see, and so then from that on, I started hanging out with the motorcycle people because that's where I wanted to be. I couldn't communicate, but I wanted to be with him. I used to go to the shop. I used to walk up after school, yeah. walk up for an hour and a half or whatever, get up the hill and just hang out with them. It just gave me that peace, that sense of, you know, re relationship kind of thing, yeah, right? Connection. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, the motorcycle people sometimes, you know, um, not everybody, but some, you know, are involved in certain things, but perhaps are not yeah. uh, completely like legal. Like drugs or something like yeah, that. Yeah, there could be drugs or alcohol or, you know, uh, some of the sex things and yeah. so on. That all kind of sometimes goes together. I'm not labeling, I'm not saying everybody, yeah. but there is certain people. And I was uh, drawn to that, uh, the people I used to hang out with. And uh, that's uh, what I was exposed to, you see. I never seen a cocaine yeah. drug, you know. I never seen marijuana. I never seen any of these things and uh, yeah you know I will tell you the truth yes I did drugs yeah yeah, yeah. and you know a uh, drinking that was lifestyle from mm -hmm. Czech you know yeah. everybody party you couldn't have party or celebration mm -hmm. without pouring drinks yeah that's how it always was. That's how partially still mm -hmm. is in that culture. It's a cultural culture. thing. So that's what we're talking about, you know, breaking loose or breaking away from an oppressive system. Now, here is my question to you again, Milan. Now, we're going to speed up. I know yes. you've got quite a lot of things to talk about. You know, you can tell us about working for the oil company, you yeah. know, living a dream of freedom. Now. As you were associated yourself with, uh, you know, the motorcycle, you had an, a motorcycle accident and you thought you were going to die. Tell us briefly about that. There was a couple of accidents where one of them I thought for sure I was going to be. The second one, mm -hmm. uh, one happened in 1989. Mm -hmm. It was in Ontario. I got hit from behind mm -hmm. uh, by a driver. The, the older gentleman didn't see me and my girlfriend sitting behind me and he slammed into us on the intersection and we were scattered all over. Uh, I kind of walked away from that one. I was kind of amazing. Huh? Mm -hmm. But within about 10 months later in Fort McMurray, I hit a pickup truck on full speed. Uh, and uh, at that time, you know, interesting thing is people sometimes have these uh, experiences. I had an experience when, when you're going on high speed and uh, the pickup truck moves in front of you and your motorcycle, it's approaching quick. You're only like 10, 15 feet away and all of a sudden the time completely slows down. Mm -hmm. Incredible. I never experienced yeah. that before. Oh. It's like that split of second talk two minutes. Mm -hmm. It was just slowly happened. And as I hit, I don't remember nothing mm -hmm. until I was laying on the ground on the other side and a friend of mine see that whole accident happened. He says, you flew about 30 feet up, flipped a couple times and fell down. He says, I thought you were dead. Oh, wow. But you see, I didn't die. Mm -hmm. There was somebody protected me at that oh, time. And Again, at that time you did not know God was protecting you. I, I did you. not know. I was leaving. I, I owned at that time, I owned the motorcycle store mm -hmm. in Fort McMurray. Mm -hmm. And I was living my dream. I had motorcycles. I rode motorcycles. I was part of the motorcycle scene in Fort McMurray. I was, um, 
you know, the dealer, I became Harley Davidson dealer, which means not just fixing motorcycles, having the official sign, franchise, selling brand new product and so on. And that was always my dream. Yeah. But the, as the life went on, yeah. you see, there was difficulties were in my life and unresolved things which I didn't care about. And, you know, the, the little question came in my mind from time to time, what's going to happen when you die one day? That question just surfaced in my mind. And I remember I sat in my office, nobody was there, and, and I thought about it. And I go, well, if there is such a thing as heaven and hell, if, I don't know, it's what my grandma used to tell me. Yeah. You know? So I thought, well, if I die, I, I, I think I should end up in, I, I think, you see, I think I should end up in heaven because I never killed anybody. I never raped anybody. I'm not like the bad people, but I made a lot of bad things, but did, but you know, I never did that bad things. I thought, you know, I thought I'm a kind of, okay, if, if there is heaven, I kind of will make it, I think. Yeah. And so anyway, so what happened here that, um, Lives and challenges and difficulties, and I could never answer this question clearly. And uh, one day we were invited um, to um, drama. The person who introduced me, one of the people, to the drugs, he got saved and born again. I didn't understand that, okay? But he was a totally different man. His name was Don Minard, and uh, we called him Trooper. And and, um, you know, he lost everything and he left town and he comes two years later and he was a new guy. Uh -huh. And I couldn't stand him because I couldn't understand him, you see. Yes. Because like something was like glowing out of him and I, I didn't understand. I didn't want to have nothing to do with him. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have nothing to do with him. It was like freaking me out, you see. Yeah. And he invited us to this drama. And me and my girlfriend, um, or um, um, my girlfriend, uh, we, we were not married. We were living together. I did everything backwards. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever the Bible says, I, li I did everything backwards in my life. And, and so anyway, they invited us to Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. It was a drama. I didn't want to go, but I did. My life was falling apart. I just said, I'm going to go. It's good for the business. Yeah. Me and my girlfriend were fighting. She says, I'm going. I said, I'm going too. So we went. And, you know, people were hugging me at the door, and I couldn't receive it. I thought, there's something wrong with these people. Yeah. They were hugging me. They want to shake my hands, give me hugs. And I thought, there's something, there's something wrong with and these And these people. were Christians. They were Christians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I, I showed up with my motorcycle jacket, long hair, long beard. You know, that's how I lived. Yeah. And somebody's trying to hug me, you know. Yeah. This doesn't work, right? Yeah. And so I told my uh, fiancé, I said, girlfriend, I said, we're going to sit in the back of that mm. church. Because it was kind of a different type of church. Yeah. I didn't understand that there yeah. was no, no uh, statues, no uh. pictures of Jesus. There was uh. just a cross and Jesus yeah. was missing. Yeah. I go, what's wrong with this place here, <laughs> yeah. you know? Carpet, you know, no marble floors, yeah. you know, nothing like that. So anyway, we're sitting there and they start the drama. And the guy said with the microphone, in your life, um, you know, um, um, he says, first of all, he said, we're going to present you with drama of Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. I said, okay. I said, we're going to get out anyway. We were sitting next to the exit sign. We're going to get out when they start. Guess what? When the show drama started, I had no desire to leave. I had no desire to leave. Something happened in my heart. And I saw Jesus walking in and people were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Something happened. It reminded me what grandma used to talk to me about, you see, when I was little. And then they showed Jesus visually crucified, and then they showed people's lives, and they showed five or six parts, and it was like my life. They were playing my life. Yeah. I was watching it, and I said, how do they know my life? Mm -hmm. And on the end of that, the guy goes up with the microphone, and he says, in your life, in, in our life, there was a lot of people, and they said, everybody has to make a, a the decision. most important decision. There's yes. one most important decision. Mm -hmm. When we stand in front of God, we're gonna answer one question. Mm -hmm. do you receive, did you receive Jesus? Or did you reject him? Mm -hmm. Nothing in between. And I always lived in between someplace, you yeah. see? Always in between. Mm -hmm. And so when they ask if you want to accept Jesus Christ into your, into your heart, I didn't understand Bible. I didn't understand teachings, preachings, preachers, nothing. Mm -hmm. I stood up in the back, but the funny thing is, my girlfriend, mm -hmm. at exact same split of seconds, stood up also. And I was shocked. She stood up, I stood up. She, uh, they said, come to the altar for a little prayer. Mm -hmm. We start walking through the aisle. She looks at me. She says, you don't have to do it for me. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for myself. You see, they were fighting, you see. Yeah. I accepted Jesus Christ at that moment, my wow. brother. And at that moment, mm -hmm. at, from that moment, mm -hmm. two things happened. Yeah. Peace of God came into my heart, what I never had before. Amen. From that moment, I know what's going to happen 
If I go outside here today and I drop dead, yeah. I'm with the Lord. I Amen. know that. Amen. Not because somebody told me, mm -hmm. but because Christ lives in me. I have accepted him. Amen. And he forgave me all my sins, all the filth and burden in my life. It was like removed from me that moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that was God. the day when I accepted that Jesus That was the Christ. day that Brother Milan gave his life to the Lord. Oh, how wonderful, how precious to hear that. That was the moment Jesus took up and uh, he broke the oppression that was oppressing him for years. Brother Milan will be back on our program next time to share the miraculous, now the miracles that he experienced thereafter he gave his life to the Lord. Look at this. You got to understand certain things will try to hold you down. You know, there, there are things that will oppress you. There are people right now watching this program. You hear voices. You hear things that are telling you you are nothing. You can't be what God called you to be. You are confused. You are living in a dilemma life. I bring good news to you. Just like Brother Milan was able to break out of that oppression or oppressive spirit or system of the enemy, you you too can break out. You too can break out of addiction. You too can break out of sin. You too can break out of a life of emptiness. There is nothing that can give you, you know, fulfillment in life. He, he had the motorcycle. His passion was for the motorcycle. But he found himself empty at, at the end of the day. It did not fulfill him. It did not complete him. There's only one thing that can complete you and complete me. There's only one thing that brings accomplishment, and that is the Word of God. As you listen to this, to this program, wherever you are in life, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you, don't give up in life. Don't quit in life. Don't remain where you are. God's plans are for your own good, to give you a future, to give you a purpose, to give you a will to live life in another dimension. I'm so glad just to hear this testimony of how he broke loose from uh, you know, the oppression of the enemy the oppression of the system, the communist system. You too, what is your oppression system? Which system is oppressing you? What is your communist? Is it sin? Is it the power of the enemy? Is it the influence of the world? You too, you can break loose from it. And I want to pray for you as you listen to this program. Father, in the name of Jesus, we declare the Spirit of God. We declare the Spirit of God upon each and every individual listening to this program. We break any oppressive system out of their lives. We declare freedom and liberty that comes from God. As Isaiah 61 says, says, Father, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Therefore, he has anointed me to break the chains, to set the captives free. Father, we release those who are in captivity in the name of Jesus Christ. We want to hear your testimony. Quickly, write to us live at kazumbachows.com. Tune in every day uh, to the Holy Spirit Broadcasting Network, uh, to this program, Kingdom Inside, where we bring you life-changing messages. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. Until then, shalom, shalom. I hope you've been enjoying the teachings and we've got some resources to send your way. The resources that are going to empower you and supplement the word of God that you've been listening on Kingdom Insight. The first book I want to send to you is uh, The Weapon of Forgiveness. This is a very powerful book that dismantles the tactics of the enemy that sneaks into the people's life through unforgiveness. And the next one I want to send to you is uh, the, uh, the Parables of the Kingdom of God. You learn in this book the insights of the Kingdom of God, the character and the nature of the Kingdom of God. What is the Kingdom of God? Well, through this book, you'll be able to see what the Kingdom of God really is about. And the other book that I don't have right now in my hands to send to you is a book titled Revisiting the Foundations, Psalms 11 verse 3. If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? I want to send you that book. Obviously, you'll be able to see it on your screen. My wife and I will be praying for you and we will be 
praying for you. When you send us that email, be it, you know, healing email or anything, we will be praying for you. God bless you. Enjoy, enjoy Kingdom Insight. Visit our website for more resources, you know, ChristPassion.org, uh, KazumbaChows.com, uh, HSBN.TV. We are all about bringing the Word of God. And we, we want you to be empowered, impacted with life and spirit-filled Word of God. Don't lose out on the battle. The Word of God is there for you. And we are so excited. We want to hear from you. God bless you. Shalom.